Hey guys, this is G, and today we're talking about float roll. One of the biggest misconceptions is that float roll is the thing you add to the mixture to create cells. This couldn't be further from the truth. Okay? And allow me to explain and even demonstrate how you can get a canvas covered in cells with float roll, without float roll, it's all the same. So let's first identify what float roll is, what it does, and how does it impact a credit port. Okay? So there's American float roll. Uh, it has the white cap or the orange cap. There is Australian float roll. It has the red label. And mind you, they're not called American float roll and Australian float roll. It's just the product that's in the US and the product that's in Australia. And there's the European counterpart of these products, which is called Oat Roll. Effectively, what these three do is they're paint conditioners. They're not actually pouring mediums. Okay, And I say that because pouring mediums are primarily made of binders, whereas float roll and Oat Roll the binder content is much lower. Now, that being said, when we say it's paint conditioner, the conditioning that it's doing to the paint is to get it to self-level and to hide brush strokes, right? So effectively, what you can think of it as is paint conditioners help paints move, okay? Now, moving is a critical part of creating cells in a painting because what if you have any experience in this or if you've seen my previous videos or perhaps you've taken my course, um, cells are a result of density variation and even if you have density variation if nothing moves nothing will happen right so the fact that it helps the paint move creates an environment that is easy for cells to be created in but it's not a guarantee that cells will happen right so if you naturally stumble onto uh, a set of colors that happen to be of a big enough density that when you move them a certain way you might get cells. You may use the right colors or the right mixtures, but you don't move it a certain way. No cells will occur. So you'll find that some people will get cells with float roll or with the paint conditioner family and some won't. And they can't necessarily explain why or why not it's happening. So let's first set Australian float roll aside for a moment and I'll come back to it later. American float roll is the one that's really um, popular among people when people give recipes, including myself. Uh, recipes are usually in parts of paint and float roll. And the reason behind that is float roll is, as I, to I told you, it's not actually a pouring medium, it's just a pouring medium substitute. And it's a substitute because A, it's much cheaper, um, like significantly, significantly cheaper than actual retail pouring medium. And at the same time, it's very accessible in the US where the majority of people who happen to practice this art form are. Um, you can get it at Home Depot uh, for as little as $7 to 15 or uh, I think 20 for the for the big jug. Uh, I could be wrong, but uh, it's cost effective and it's only cost effective for them. So if you're in Europe and you're thinking about shipping American float roll, ju just don't do it. Like it's so cost ineffective for a thing that's a substitute to begin with. If you're going to pay that much money, just buy the retail pouring medium. So why is it that when people use other pouring mediums or uh, the retail pouring medium or the other alternatives besides float roll, how come they don't stumble on cells accidentally as frequently as people who do use float roll? It's simpler than you think. So um, PVA glue, uh, varnish, retail pouring medium, these are all very elastic uh, materials. If you think about it, if you take, if you just put some float roll on your hand and do this, it's not very sticky, right? Whereas PVA glue, varnish um, and retail pouring medium are very, very sticky. Uh, they're very elastic. This elastic nature makes it so that cells or pockets of color don't really move as easily um, in a painting. So coming across cells accidentally happens much, much less frequently. However, with that being said, that doesn't mean you don't get cells when you use uh, the elastic pouring mediums like varnish, PVA glue, and retail pouring medium. The difference is that usually you would be using a cell additive uh, like silicone oil and you will most likely need heat to bring it to the surface just to, as I said, the elasticity of the binders makes it so that cells don't move as easily, right? So if you spot heat, that effectively brings the cells to the surface much faster. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate three different things. I'm going to make a painting a swipe with float roll as the medium, a different one with my acrylic varnish, the one I always use and is in all my videos, um, as the medium, 
and I'll also do one with PVA glue as the medium. Um, they will all be swipes, they will all be with silicone oil, and hopefully I'll be able to give you a proper understanding of what it is Floatrol actually does in the painting. Okay, so these are the materials I'm using. Flood Floatrol, or Flood 6, as it's commonly known. This is the American float roll. This is the one that you'd use. Remember I said it's sometimes an orange or a white cap. They're the same. This is the acrylic varnish that I use. Realistically speaking, you're not going to have anything similar to this, regardless of where you are. I've checked uh, varnish in the West and in Australia and in Europe. I've come to find this very thin. Uh, even the acrylic one, not the polyurethane one. Uh, and this inconsistency is honestly closer to glue than it is to anything. It's acrylic polymer based, uh, if if you're a chemistry nerd. Uh, and this is actually what I use here locally. And then, because we don't have glue all in Egypt, uh, Elmer's glue all, this is a PVA glue. <clears throat> this is the most common PVA glue we have. Um, and this is what I'll be using. Both of these are too thick to use as a pouring medium without watering them. Okay, so I will show you um, what they look like. The glue is so thick, like it doesn't, like you see it struggling to even leave the container. So that's extremely thick. And then the varnish is also thick, but a little thinner than that. Let me just open the container. Pretty, you can see as I tilt that it doesn't move very quickly. It's not very runny. Okay. And as I had mentioned before, the elasticity thing, do you see? Glue does this, varnish does this, float roll does not. This is float roll out of the container. Haven't added anything to it, no water, no uh, thinning it, no thickening it. This is just what it looks like. And mind you, um, we're now in, what is it, December? Egypt isn't really that cold, but it's winter time, so it's thicker than it would normally be for me in the summer, if that makes sense. So that's the float hole, okay? The glue and water mixture, for this experiment to really work, I have to make the consistencies the same. So I've added enough water that the glue also looks like the float roll. See? The result's pretty much the same way. Comes off smoothly off the stick, and then sinks immediately on contact with the surface of the paint in the cup and my acrylic varnish with water same thing right so now you know that the consistencies are the same okay so now as we begin to test them we've eliminated the consistency variable okay okay so it's time to run our experiment so what i've got here is i've got three different tiles What's on the tile is the pouring medium and white paint. So float roll and white paint, glue and white paint, varnish and white paint. They're all the same consistency. Uh, we're going for a medium, the way I usually swipe. Okay, so the three tests I'm gonna do is I'm going to put down a color, each with the corresponding pouring medium, and then a different color, also with the corresponding pouring medium, with a drop of silicone in each, and this, in my opinion, is going to be a great way to illustrate the difference between them. Okay? So first the float roll. Okay. The glue. And finally the varnish. So you can see around the edges it looks different. This is a result of them as a material. So I'm going to add my float roll with silicone like I would if I was doing a swipe. Just a line over here so I can swipe with. Same here. And then again here. Time to swipe. 
Here is the varnish. Here is the glue. And here is the flow twirl. So obviously you notice an immediate difference, right? At the moment, flow twirl looks the best. Varnish isn't really giving us much. We've got a few small cells. The glue did some weird stuff with the blue, right? Because it seems to be sinking into the white a little. But what happens if we introduce heat? So use a lighter that has this sort of flame, right? Right? There you go. You're seeing it pop up in the varnish. Let's look at the glue. Same thing here, but with the float roll, not much happens because the majority of what has happened has already happened, right? But let's look at the difference in cell structure, right? So let's look at the float roll. While we have a lot of cells, it gets very messy very quickly. Whereas over here on the varnish, the clusters look very well defined. You know, and because they don't immediately pop to the surface, you're able to control where they go with your heat source. Now, mind you, this place where we originally put um, the black, this is where it's thickest. So if we were to spread this out a little, we get more cells here as well. The glue, while the reaction isn't amazing, it does, it almost looks like pearl cells down here when we got to um, the white. But this is just because of the consistency. And this is why I generally like to avoid glue as a pouring medium. Because while it's cheap, and it's affordable, and it's accessible, it's very problematic, as you can see. Plus, glue is generally not a very archival material. It's not generally thought of as a high-quality material. So it sort of takes away from the value of your painting. So as you can see from the experiment, right off the bat, there's a misconception about how flow Floatrol is actually used. Um, flow twirl is used as a pouring medium, it's used in large quantities to mix your paints in, whereas a cell additive like silicone oil is a component that you add in single drops to create cells. Now, as you also saw in the experiment, flow twirl does um, make the environment easier for cells to pop up. We didn't need to introduce heat at all, but you could also see that the pouring medium does in fact affect the overall look in the end, but it is not the component that actually creates the cells. Right. So it is it's sort of like an ecosystem where you have to take both into account uh, and make a decision based on the outcome that you want. And in no way should you feel like you need float roll to do acrylic pouring. It's just the most common and affordable one for the majority of people. If you don't happen to be one of these people, that's perfectly OK. There's tons of other options. Remember, retail pouring medium, PVA glue, varnish, uh, even untinted house paint in some cases, anything that is a water based material that dries clear could be a possible candidate for you and these will differ from market to market. Now remember I had said let's set aside Australian float roll for the moment. The reason I said that is Australian float roll is actually not used as a pouring medium nor as a cell additive. It's neither like US float roll nor like silicone oil. The way it's used is it's a component in one specific technique called the bloom technique and it goes in the top layer only. It's not used throughout all the components and it creates a special effect called lacing. What's inside the lacing is what we call cells, but the outline of the cells is called lacing. In lacing, it's a little bit more geometric looking. There's uh, sharp corners as opposed to curves that you'd see in silicone oil, um, but that's a whole separate video that I will do at a later time. 
If you enjoyed this video or found the information in this video useful, I do want to let you know that I have an online course, it's self-paced, that teaches you everything you need to know about acrylic pouring. And I take this same scientific approach in teaching you the materials and their alternatives and why or why not you should be using them or should not be using them. And we'll explore techniques in detail, we'll explore cells, their development, why, how, and we'll explore things like why the paint cracks and how to prevent it. We also explore color theory, how to price your paintings, and so much more. So check that out. I'll leave the link in the pinned comments. Let me know what you think, and I'll see you in the next video.